family, Black Power, One Love. How's everybody doing? Where the Bronx at? Is the Bronx in here tonight? Where the Bronx at? Where the Bronx at? Where the Bronx at? Where Harlem? Where Harlem at? Queens, Staten Island, Long Island. Welcome, brothers and sisters. Dr. Umar Johnson is glad to be back in New York. Glad to be back in the five boroughs. This is my first time to the Bronx. First time ever in the boogie down. Man. Beach Street is one of my favorite movies. Y'all know that. KRS, one of my favorite artists. So I'm glad to be in the Bronx. I don't know why it took 10 years, but it's better late than never. Now let me ask a question, because I've been trying to figure this out since I've been coming to New York these past nine years. Which of the five boroughs has the most black consciousness? Is it Brooklyn? Is it Harlem? Brooklyn somewhere in there. So that means if I go to the if I go to Brooklyn, I won't see no brothers with no white girls there, right? That's what you're talking about. Okay? So if I go out here to the Bronx, I ain't gonna see no brothers with no white girls. Okay. Brothers and sisters, on this day, 18 years ago, one of the greatest black revolutionaries in modern history graduated from this earth plane and went to join the ancestors on the ancestral plane. His name was Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Dr. Umar's first visit to the Bronx is on the day of ascension of the late, great Dr. Collins. So what I want to do, if you will join me, please, for one moment, 60 seconds of silence in honor of Dr. Collins. Ashe. All right. I want to start off tonight because it's my first time in the Bronx. And first and foremost, I'm a psychologist and an educator, first and foremost. So before we deal with the politics and the Pan-Africanism, I want to talk to all my parents here tonight. And I want to give every parent in here 10 tips for dealing with the miseducation machine. 10 tips for dealing with the mental health exploitation machine. Tip number one, for every mother, every father, every foster mother, foster parent, adoptive parent, older brother and sister taking care of your younger siblings, aunts and uncles, whomever you may be, if you are responsible for the life and education of a young African child, I want you to take these 10 tips to heart. Because if you do what Dr. Umar tells you to do, we'll never have to worry about your children being misdiagnosed, psychiatrically medicated, put in special ed jail, or being the latest casualty in the school to prison pipeline. 
Tip number one, never sign any paperwork that the schools in New York City give you for your child unless you take that paperwork home first. Meditate on it. Decide if you really want to sign this and then take it back. We have a bad habit. Black mothers and black fathers, we have a bad habit, auntie and uncle, of signing paperwork on the spot that we don't really understand. Are you following me? No more signing paperwork that you don't understand. And by the way, I see some ladies standing. If you want a seat, raise your hand, sisters, because we're going to get you a seat. Is everybody all right? Do y'all want to stand? Because if not, we can get some of these brothers to give you a seat. That's right. Y'all yeah. standing on all oh, the food line. Oh, I'm on oh, I chicken wings. Oh, I shake. I knew something was, I thought it was the weed line. I'm sorry. I thought it was a blunt. That new government marijuana. So number one, don't sign the paperwork. Now, as someone who works in black schools or white schools, I can tell you that they don't make white parents sign on the spot. They don't make white parents sign on the spot. They give them the letter, they put it in an envelope, and they send it home. Only in the black community do they expect you to sign on the spot. And the reason they expect you to sign on the spot is there's an assumption about you. And the assumption is you don't really care anyway. That's the assumption. So what you have to do is retrain the schools in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, in Manhattan, Staten Island, Queens, you have to train them in Jersey and Connecticut on how to deal with you. And the way you train them is first of all letting them know I sign nothing on the spot. Because white folks love to lie to you. And they'll tell you this is just for the free lunch. And the next thing you know he walking out with some free handcuffs on. So you don't sign it on the spot. And if you don't understand it, that's what I'm here for. Before you leave here tonight, every one of you going to have my personal cell phone number. Ladies, it ain't that kind of party. <laughs> you will have my personal cell phone number. And if it's a quick question, you can text me. I answer quick questions all day long. Dr. Umar, what does this word mean here? Because I've never seen it before, and I'll tell you what they're up to. You can take a picture of the form they want you to sign and text it to me. Dr. Umar, what is this? And I'll tell you, that's a permission to evaluate form, but they're disguising it. It's for a special ed evaluation, but they're disguising it. They're not gonna tell you this is for special education. They're gonna say this is for special help. So they get tricky with the words. So you have your own personal parent advocate in myself. And you'll have that information before we leave here today. So number one, don't sign. Number two, black mothers, my Afro-Latino mothers included, we all family. And the second point is what? Don't go to any school meetings by yourself. I hope my black mothers heard that. Because I know you strong. And I know you can do this without the father. But I don't want you going to any meetings in the Bronx by yourself because it is a setup for a setback on your child's behalf. The school is an extension of the prison system. And the principals are the new wardens. And the teachers are the new police officers. And anything you say can and will be used against you and your child. Listen. Some of y'all are going to say, Dr. Umar, I don't have no support. Yes, you do. Because we have an organization that every one of you is going to join called the National Independent Black Parent Association. You understand? And we will go with you into the school if you have no one else. But even if we're not available, black woman, take the father. If you and the father can't sit in front of white folks without fighting, take an uncle. Take a cousin. And guess what? If you can't find any alpha males, because we're running out of alpha males, we got a whole damn community full of babies. Skinny jeans and pointy dress shoes. <laughs> black woman, if you can't find a black man to go with you with a backbone, I'm going to tell you what you do. Because a lot of the professional brothers 
been turned into swag for fag energy. Okay? So if you can't find a swag delicious brother, go to the corner and get Pookie and Ray Ray. I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. Because all those white teachers in the schools down Bronx River, they scared of Pookie and Ray Ray. Because they was the ones who got Pookie and Ray Ray started in the school to prison pipeline. So bring Pookie and Ray Ray, wife beater and 50 tattoos. And you bring Pookie and Ray Ray into the meeting about little Raheem. And you tell Pookie and Ray Ray, I don't want you to do no talking. Because you're going to mess this shit up. Be quiet. <laughs> but if you see the white folks and the two coons, because there's always two coons. <laughs> every white school, every public school in New York City got two coons on the payroll. And what is the job of those two coons? And by the way, they may not be bourgeois. They might be whole teppers. Oh yes. Oh yes, Baba Shaka Zulu, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mama Coochie Chaka Leah, yep. They on the payroll. And we hate black people charter school, South Bronx. And when the white folks can't get you to sign that paper, they'll send Mama Coochie Chocolate and Baba King Tut smelling like frankincense and fresh shea butter. <laughs> and they will guilt you into signing the papers. That's right. Don't you care about your son? We knew Dr. Umar was in the Bronx on Sunday night, but don't believe everything he say. My grandson was on Ritalin. Remember my little, grand, my little grandson, Mike Mike? He was on Ritalin and conservative. Remember my other grandson, little Charles? He was on Metadate, Risperdal, and Prozac. And them boys turned out fine. Yeah, they caught him running butt naked down the street last night, but that ain't had nothing to do with the drugs. Yeah, they caught little Charles killing every dog in Brooklyn, but not because of the drugs. So beware of black folks who work for the school system. I'm not saying that they're all sellouts because they're not. Most of our black teachers really do care. But every school keeps two coons whose job is to make you give up your position. And what you tell Pookie and Ray Ray is when they start ganging up on me in this meeting, Pookie and Ray Ray, I want you to do one thing. Don't talk. But bang your fist real hard on the desk. <laughs> Open your eyes real wide. Look the cracker close. And say, I'm not feeling this shit. <laughs> and if you do that, I bet you the whole meeting will change. The white folks will say, oh, I'm sorry, it's the wrong kid. I think we can work with him. We might not need medicine. I think we have another option we haven't tried yet. See, when you bring an alpha male with you, they deal with you differently. Oh, yes. I work in schools. I know how they do, y'all. I'm a former school principal. I know how they do, y'all. They love a single black mother walking into New York schools by herself. Because single black mother means no support. It means no help. It means she's stressed out. It means she'll sign anything to get us to stop calling her and leave her son alone, including that ADHD evaluation. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Because I know half y'all got y'all sons on crack for kids right now. Oh yes, I can see it in your face. Some of y'all got kids on Ritalin right now. Concerta right now. Meditate right now. Cycler right now. For no other reason than a white teacher told you that your baby needs medication to get an education. Since when do you need don't in order to be miseducated. But this is what they've created. And in a second, I'm going to show you how we got here. See, we love studying ancient history, and we should. We love studying classical history, and we should. We love talking about the sun, moon, and stars, and we should. 
But there's a history I want you to master. And you're going to master it tonight. And it's the history of what happened from the assassination of Dr. King, 1968, until today. These last 50 years. That's what you need to master. How did you go from King to incarceration so quickly? How did we go from Civil Rights Bill and Voting Rights Act to no identifiable black leader at all today? Jesse is gone, Isle is gone. Urban League, NAACP, Congressional Black Caucus. Nobody's standing up. And guess how they disappeared? They disappeared because they only have one solution. And that's called voting. But guess what? You're too intelligent and your children are too intelligent. So you understand that you can't vote away police brutality. It was police brutality that made the bourgeoisie leader extinct in today's black America. When Al Sharpton went to Baltimore and they disinvited him, when he went to Charleston, South Carolina after the Dylan Roof tragedy and the brothers and sisters said, no thank you, because you don't have any solutions for us. So now you are living in a black America for the first time in a long time without an identified leader. In fact, what the white man has done is he has elevated athletes and entertainers and hip hop artists to be your leaders. Show me another community where the entertainers are the leaders. Are the Jewish entertainers the leaders of Jewish people? Are the Irish entertainers the leaders of Irish people? So why are the black entertainers the leaders of black people? I'll tell you why. White supremacy cannot allow a black America without an identified leader. Do you know why? If they do not give you a leader, you will choose one from amongst yourselves. And he can't have that. Because when black people choose their own leaders, those leaders tend to be revolutionaries. So the white man says you never leave a ghetto without an identified leader. So since we don't have any black politicians that they respect, we don't have any black preachers that they respect, we don't have any black businessmen that they respect, so we're going to give them a rapper and a basketball player. People we own, and people we control, and people who have an insatiable appetite for white girls. Now, since we're on the topic of white girls, it is my hope that there's not a black man in this just nature gymnasium tonight who is dating your oppressor's daughter, sister, cousin, or niece. It is my hope that there ain't no Negroes in here cooning tonight. It is absolute, 100% unapologetically disrespectful for a black man to walk down the street with anything other than a black woman. I want to be clear about that. I want to be absolutely clear about that. Somebody texted me last week. They said, Dr. Umar, I don't know if you know this, but you're the only one of the so-called conscious leaders, and I hate to use that word because they're not leaders at all, they're just YouTube agitators. But they said, you're the only conscious leader who openly says black men have no business dating white girls or other non-Africans. Right. And they said, why do you think you're the only one? The rest of them are pro-black too, but they won't go that far. I said, because they like to dip once in a while. And some Chinese cookies. Every once in a while, they want some East Indian cookies. Every once in a while, they want some stale-ass vanilla cookies. And for the life of me, and I mean no disrespect to white women, I have two daughters and I want white women to respect my daughters and I respect white women. 
but I don't understand what the black man finds attractive about the white woman. I'm not being disrespectful. But when I look at her and compare her to the goddess, I don't see anything even close to a black woman. First of all, black women know how to cook. And you know damn well Betsy can't even make a damn egg sandwich without screwing it up. She don't know nothing about no church sauce or no paprika. She give you an extra thick cold mayonnaise sandwich straight from the dungeons of Europe. Black women know how to smell all good with all those shake butters and almond butters and cocoa butters and peanut butters. White women don't have that scent with her. The black woman's skin has a fragrance that's like no other woman. And then you look at the shape. Good God, oh my. I don't care if she petite. I don't care if she's slim thick. You know slim thick, right? They petite, but they bullshit. I don't care if she's voluptuous or full figure. Black woman got a swag and a bounce and an elegance that no other woman on earth can even imitate. But let me be a little bit more clear with you tonight, Bronx. My objection to interracial dating is not based on emotions. It's based on economics. Marriage is a financial contract. I don't care how much you love somebody, marriage is about sense. If you don't believe me, I want you to go to divorce court tomorrow and I want you to tell me how many people you saw in front of the judge asking for half of their love back. Who the hell goes to divorce court looking for half of their sex back? Who goes to the vault court looking for half of my back massages back? Ain't nobody caring about none of that. They in there to get assets, homes, businesses, 401ks. Marriage is financial for the white girl. For the black man, it's emotional. If you don't believe me, go ask Bill Cosby. My North Philadelphia brother, 82 years old, in a general population prison in Pennsylvania right now because he fell to forget that white folks do not put black people in categories. I don't care if you got one degree, eight PhDs, or a 1970 GED. Your ass is Negro. Bill Cosby thought because he was a Bill, First black ass here tonight think you went the honorary Caucasian club. Oprah Winfrey once thought she was in the honorary Caucasian club. But I remember I was in Bermuda speaking a couple years ago. And they told me in Bermuda that Oprah came to Bermuda to buy a vacation home in a private white community in an all black island. And the white folks voted that Oprah could not purchase a property. And she had more money than all the white folks put together in the community. And they said, we don't want Oprah. What is the message, New York City? The message is money has nothing to do with power. And until you understand that, you will never understand how they was able to disinvite my other North Philadelphia brother, Kevin Hart, from hosting the Oscars. See, Kevin Hart being kicked off the Oscars had nothing to do with a gay tweet 10 years ago. It had everything to do with the fact that we've already had enough black people hosting the Oscars, we don't need another one, especially not a dark-skinned one. So what they did was they used LGBTism as a white supremacist weapon to keep a black man from hosting by turning Kevin Hart into the perpetrator 
when he was really the victim. They took Bill Cosby, legally blind, 82, and they went and found 40 nasty looking mayonnaise white girls. And all these white women got into a Buddhist meditation circle at one time. And they started floating and said, we were sexually harassed 40 years ago. Can I ask you a question? What white woman is going to wait 40 years to tell a black man who's guilty? <laughs> at the time of the alleged abuse, Bill Cosby was the number one television personality in the country. And you say nothing while you're a young, thought to be attractive white girl. You wait till you're 40 years old and nasty looking to finally say Bill Cosby harassed me. And then the black feminists started running around talking about justice for us. How silly can you be? Since when did the white woman become the black woman's friend? Because when I go to slavery, Let's go back 150 years. See, some of us think slavery was a long time ago. It lasted a long time, but it just ended a century and a half ago. My great, great, great grandfather, George Washington Bailey, the cousin of Frederick Douglass, was a slave. Great, 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 that's it. Great, 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 that's it. And during slavery, did you know the white woman couldn't stand the black woman? Yes. She would catch her husband staring out the window while you picking cotton. He looking at all at those thighs. He looking at butter almond thighs in the sun. Butter pecan in the sun. Dark caramel in the sun. Pistachio in the sun. That chocolate fudge in the sun. And because the white slave master started to develop an emotional attachment to the black woman, the white woman would make the white man sell all your babies away to prove he didn't care about them. The white woman would make the white man whip the skin off your back to prove he had no affection for you. The white woman was the black woman's devil. And all of a sudden, she's your friend. The white woman can't stand you no more than the white man can stand us. Feminism ain't about black female empowerment. Feminism is about black family destruction. Listen, when the white woman fought the white man, I understand why. The white man told the white woman, you're not allowed to vote. The white man told the white woman, you can't wear pants. The white man told the white woman, you can't own the business. The white man told the white woman, you can't be a judge. The white man told the white woman, you can't go to college. The white man told the white woman, your job is to make babies and breakfast. The white woman didn't even get the right to vote till the 1920s. White man has never said the woman his equal. I understand why the white woman had a feminist fight, but I don't understand you. Why not, Dr. Umar? Because feminism is about fighting against systematic, systematic, systematic male oppression and paternalism. Here's the question, black woman, you got to ask me if you're a feminist. You got to answer for me. What systems do black men control in New York that we can use to systematically oppress black women? Do we control the jobs in this city? Do we control the government in this city? Do we control the schools in this city? Do we control the economy in this city? So how can the black man be the black woman's number one problem when we control no systems through which we can systematically oppress you? When's the last time a black man told a black woman she wasn't allowed to work? <laughs> when you make more money than we did. When the last time a black man told a woman, a black woman, 
she couldn't wear no jeans outside. You know how good you look at some damn jeans? <laughs> Feminism ain't got nothing to do with us at all. Rule number three. One was, don't sign nothing unless you take it home and read it. Two was, don't go to no meetings by yourself. Because when you go to that meeting by yourself, what do they do, black mother? They put you in a room all by yourself. We hate black people public school, South Bronx. <laughs> and that white, that black mother is sitting there waiting for the meeting to start about John John's behavior problems, right? And then all of a sudden the door opens and 25 crackers walk in. That's right. The principal, the vice principal, the principal intern, the counselor, the nurse, the psychologist, the social worker, the dean of students, the math coach, the grade leader, the window washer, the lunch man, the bus driver, the trash man. Y'all know what I'm talking about. For one black mother, 25 Caucasians. Do you know why they do that? To intimidate you, number one, intellectually and socially. Because they start saying stuff like this. We know you love your son, but I've been teaching for 20 years. We know you love your son, but I have a doctorate from Harvard. We know you love your son, but I've been a reading specialist for 20 years. We know you love your son, but I was national teacher of the year last year. And they throw out degrees and titles to make black women think white folks know more about your child than you do. And I'm here to let every one of you parents know something. Don't you ever forget it, Bronx. You are always the expert on your baby. Listen, I believe I'm the greatest school psychologist who ever lived. But I still don't know your child better than you do. Listen, when I evaluate a child, I might spend two, three days with your child. I might spend two, three days evaluating, observing your baby. That's it. And from three days of testing, they're asking me whether or not Raheem has a reading disability. Whether or not Shaquita has a math disability. Whether or not little Tay Tay is emotionally disturbed. Whether or not baby King Tut <laughs> has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And what I need everybody in here to understand is you cannot prove a learning disability. I hope you listening, because I know I got some black parents in here with, parent, with boys and girls with IEPs. He got an IEP for reading. She got an IEP for reading comprehension. She got an IEP for math calculations. He got an IEP for math reasoning. He got an IEP for oral expression. She got an IEP for listening comprehension. And guess what? I can't prove none of them. You cannot prove a learning disability, parents. There's no blood test. There's no urine sample. There's no MRI. There's no CAT scan. There's no DNA sample that can tell you if your child has a reading disability. It is nothing but a professional opinion that Neanderthal gave you. <laughs> well, why do you say that? Because 99% of all school psychologists in America are something other than black. Let me say it again. 99% of all school psychologists in America are something other than African. Let me say it again. 99% of the people putting your child in special education don't look like them and don't understand them. This is why if I lived in the Bronx, Harlem, Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, Jersey, and they asked me to get my child evaluated if I thought he needed it, I would demand a black psychologist or none at all. If I knew what I know, no white person is ever sitting in front of my little girl and testing my baby without me being in the damn room, first of all. Because I don't know if y'all know, the psychological evaluation is a one-on-one -on -one thing. Oh, yes. So not only is they testing your baby, they doing it with nobody around. Oh yes! I once worked at an African-centered charter school where the speech therapist was sexually confused. 
if he would take little black boys in his office to give them speech therapy. Now this was a damn King Tut Academy. And at a King Tut, beat your drum, eat your veggie wrap, burn your frankincense incense. They was letting black boys go in the room with sexually confused Neanderthals to get their speech therapy. Well, wait a minute. If he's getting speech therapy, that means he got trouble speaking. So if something happens in that room and he needs to tell you about it, will he be able to? I'm giving y'all the facts. Before anybody takes my child out the classroom, I need to meet with that person first and they better look like my child. And then they're gonna say this, we don't have enough black school psychologists in New York City public schools. And then you're gonna answer this, that's not my problem. If you want him tested, it will be by somebody who looks like him. Oh yes, the IEP don't stand for Individual Education Plan. It stands for Individual Incarceration Plan. If a black boy can't read by the time he finishes the fifth grade, there's an 85% chance he'll be spending some of his adulthood in prison. And guess what? I'm not going to blame the white folks totally for this. I'm going to blame you, Negroes. And let me tell you why. Two months ago was Christmas. And black New York City spent over $8 billion on Christmas gifts. And most of you bought your child Christmas gifts that have nothing to do with academic improvements. You brought video games, sneakers, big screen TVs, laptops, cell phones. And as a result of the YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, iPad, cell phone, and laptop culture, Black kids don't spend any time in recreational reading anymore. Listen, Chinese kids are no smarter than yours, but they spend 15 hours a week studying outside of school. White kids are no smarter than yours, but they spend eight hours a week studying outside of school. Guess how much time the average Negro child spends in the United States of America reading outside of school, 45 minutes a week. And I'm blaming you for that. That cell phone is the reading disability. That iPad is the math disability. That big screen TV, that's the emotional disturbance. By buying your child all of these expensive gifts, you are investing in his future incarceration with your Christmas money. I was on the phone with a mother from New York last night. She said, Dr. Umar, my son, excuse me, New Jersey. My son is in school in New Jersey. He's in third grade. They want to test him for special ed. The white teacher said he needs extra help. What should I do? I said, get him the extra help. So are you saying I should let him get tested for special ed? Hell no. So what am I supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? Sit his ass down at the kitchen table, start working with him 90 minutes a night. That's what the hell you're supposed to do. And don't get me wrong, because sometimes the black mother and black father are not the ones to work with your own child. That's right. Because some of you are too verbally abusive to your own child. Some of you demand perfection from your own child. Some of you will do nothing but lower the self-esteem of your own child. So I recommend that you get your child a tutor. Look at all the retired black teachers we got in New York City. Mm. New York City has more black retired teachers than any city in America. So why are all these black kids in special ed when you got black retired teachers who would love to tutor your child? Most of them would do it for no money at all. So why do we have a special ed problem? Why do we have a learning disability problem? Why are so many black kids diagnosed as LD? 
I'll tell you the answer. They don't have a learning disability. There's no learning disability in the Bronx. There's no learning disability in Brooklyn. Your son is not reading disabled. He's lazy disabled. Your daughter does not have a math disability. Your daughter has a lazy disability. Your son could learn how to read, but he's not interested. Your daughter could learn algebra, but she don't care because she's going to be the next Cardi B and he's going to be the next Little Wayne. See, the problem in the black community is we don't socialize black kids for success. We socialize them on materialism and athletics. Isn't it amazing? The black male was brought to America to do what? Sir, your value was based on what? Your physical production. And some of you fathers in here still socializing your sons to be slaves. His value in life is exclusively based on how many jump shots he can hit. His value in life is exclusively based on how many footballs he can catch. The slave was valued based on physical output. LeBron James is valued based on physical output. One gets paid, one doesn't, but they both slaves. I don't want your son to be no football player. I want him to own the damn team. I don't want your son to be no basketball player. I want him to own the damn team. It's not enough to be LeBron. You have to be the owner of the Lakers that signs LeBron's check. It's not enough to want to be a Michael Vick. You got to be the owner of the Atlanta Falcons that sign Michael Vick's check. It's not even enough to be Jay-Z. Come on. You got to be the owner who signs Jay-Z's check. Because although he owns Rock Nation, he's not signed to Rock Nation. He signed to a white mega company whose name I forget at the time. We got to teach our children how to be bosses and stop taking losses. Rule number three. Stop telling the school all your personal business. Rule number three. Stop telling New York public schools all your personal business. And let me tell you how this happens. They keep calling you to come pick up Raheem. Pick him up, pick him up, pick him up, pick him up. You just got a new job. Good job. You're on probation. Pick him up, pick him up, pick him up. So you go to school one day looking for sympathy from white folks. And you go into the room and you say, Mrs. Slurvenowski. <laughs> this is the fourth time you've called me to come get my son. I know he's a problem, but let me tell you why. His father's in jail. My other child's father was just murdered, God forbid. I'm a single mother raising three kids on my own, living in my mother's basement. I'm a recovering addict and I'm getting myself on my feet and I just got a new job. And Miss Lewinowski, if you work with me, if you be patient with me, I promise you by June, I will be permanent. I'm going to get my family a nice house out in the Queens. I'll have more time to spend with my son and you won't have to call me anymore. And guess what Miss Lewinowski going to do? Because she know you looking for sympathy, she going to play your ass. When you start crying, guess what she going to do? Start crying. Oh, Rashida, don't dare. And she going to start rubbing you on the back, hugging you. Come on. I'm a single mother too. Me and my husband Tommy got divorced last year. I've been raising little Billy and Nathaniel all alone. Me and you should lean on each other. Can we pray together? Miss Rashida, I know you're not going to believe me because you're black and I'm white, but you're really my hero. 
And then you leave the school, and guess what happens 10 minutes later? She go right to the white principal, and she says, uh, Dr. Silverberger, I don't want to talk about Shaquita, Raheem's mom, because I really like her. But she came to me crying today. I don't know, but she might have been high on crack. And, 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 and her clothes smell like marijuanas. And I remember Raheem, he been coming to school with the same dirty school uniform on. I don't want to get Shaquita in trouble, but I'm a teacher, which means I'm obligated to tell you if I think a child is being neglected. And because you told that white woman that you a single mom, three kids, living in your mama basement, the principal is going to use that and call Child Protective Services, and they're going to come out to your house, and the next thing you know, they telling you, if you don't get them put on no medicine, we're going to take your children. That's right. That's true. Oh, yes. Talking too much destroys black families. Talking too much destroys black families. Black mother, the worst thing you can do is go to school looking for sympathy because you're not going to get it, but you will get set up to lose your kids. And then some of you say, what they want our kids for? Well, number one, America has the fastest growing LGBT population in the world, and they cannot produce biological children of their own. So guess where they're going to get them from? Your house! Black kids are disproportionately given to LGBT foster parents. Yes. If you don't believe me, do the research. Yes. Black kids without a home are damn near guaranteed. They're almost guaranteed to end up with white folks. And they don't even like it, but they'd rather have a home than no home at all. Not to mention that the child protective services industry is in bed with the undercover Hollywood and New York City music industry pedophile rings. That you got judges and politicians and mayors right here in New York who are part of an international pedophile ring. And guess where they get most of their child victims from? From child protective services. So going to your child's school and telling all your business is the quickest way to get them inducted in the world of child sex exploitation. Keep your mouth shut. Rule number five, this is for black mothers in particular. Rule number five, black mother, do me a damn favor. When you drop your kids off in the morning for school, would you please stop wearing your pajamas into the damn school building? You damn ghetto rats. You don't wear pajamas to no damn school. What the hell wrong with y'all? And you got a nerve to think you cute with the big old bunny flops on, old nasty weave all lopsided, sleep in your eye. I saw a mother coming in with a damn Gucci uh, pajama set on with her broke ass. Come on. Embarrassing the hell out of me. You don't go to the school with no damn pajamas on. Do you know what you're telling white folks when you do that? You're saying to them, I have no life. I have nothing to do. No priorities. And as soon as I drop them off, I'm going to go back in bed and keep on rerunning the Cardi B twerk video. And guess what? They're gonna call you even more now. Right. Never let the school know you unemployed. Did you hear me, mothers? Don't you ever go into that school and say, I'm out of work now. That's the worst thing you can tell them. Parents who don't work are more likely to see their kids suspended, especially if they black. And I'm gonna tell you something else. Black mother, stop letting them white folks know that you're single without a man at home. Stop letting them white folks know that you're single. Y'all love to brag about how single you are. Oh, I'm a single mom. I'm the mommy and the daddy. You can't never be no daddy. Ain't no woman in here no father. You can't be that. That's not your energy. I don't care how many chemicals and hormones you done took. I don't care how many surgeries you done had. I don't care how hard your walk is. I was walking up the street earlier, two lesbian sisters saw me, they said, she said, that's Dr. Umar, she said, don't speak to him, and they got real hard on me. 
Your daughter, she responsible. Your daughter, she's hardworking. Your daughter, she got a job, she got a scholarship, she's on the cheerleading club, and then look at his ass. Raheem is only 12 with 15 tattoos already. He talks to his mother like she's dirt, and you let him do it. You know why? Because when a woman don't have a man in her life, she normally upgrades her oldest son as her mate. For many single mothers, their oldest son is their husband. And when you're not sex, psychology. And when your oldest son becomes your husband, he becomes your source of support. And just like you can punish him, he can punish you. No more pajamas at school. <laughs> Rule number six. Whenever your child gets psychologically evaluated and you don't agree with the report, give it back. I want everybody here to hear me. You have a federal right. Whenever you disagree with the school's evaluation, you have a federal right to an independent educational evaluation. Everybody say this right after me. I-E-E. I-E-E. Say I-E-E. I-E-E. I-E-E -E means independent educational evaluation. This is a United States special ed law. I don't care if you live in New York or North Dakota. Whenever you get a report saying your son or daughter is autistic or reading disabled or retarded or ADHD or emotionally disturbed, you have a right to say I don't agree with it. You then have a right to go find your own psychologist. You have a right to have them test the child and the school district pays for it. I know because I do them in Pennsylvania all the time. So don't ever tell me, my son is in special ed and ain't nothing I can do. Yes, it is. You could have rejected the request to place him. And I'm going to tell you something else. Rule number six, I need y'all to learn how to just say no. When they come to you and say, we think he got a reading disability, can we test them? No! Yell at the ass. No! You can't be nice. See, y'all want to be nice. Well, I'm not sure. If he really has a reading, I don't really know about, see that's weak. Cause see that tells them they can convince you. Right. Y'all choose, well can I think about it? Ain't nothing to think about, no! <laughs> Yell at him, no! Crack a dome! <laughs> and then some of you say, well Dr. Umar, if I tell him no, they just gonna keep being persistent. Then you gotta put it in a letter. Dr. Silverberger. <laughs> Mrs. Betty Scundellini keeps bugging me about getting my son tested. I done told her two times I don't want no evaluation. So I'm writing you as the principal of the school and I'm asking you to please stop your teacher from harassing me. My son is not being tested for special ed. The only people who need special ed in this school are your teachers. Are y'all following me? In fact, 90% of all the children I've evaluated in my life never had a learning disability at all. They had another disability that I call ABT. Everybody say ABT. 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 And guess what that stands for? That's Dr. Umar's diagnosis. And it stands for he's not reading disabled. He just ain't never been taught. You ever heard of that? Third grade, reading disability? Let me see who the teacher was in second grade. Mm. Second grade, math disability? Let me see what school he was at for kindergarten. Mm. Because kindergarten has become daycare. I don't know if y'all know that. They're not even teaching kids how to uh, write their name and colors and letters and numbers and size. They don't teach them nothing. They sit there and they watch SpongeBob and fill out photocopies all day. Listen, if your child is in the third grade and they're struggling, get him a tutor. You don't get him an IEP. Because see, once you put your child in special ed, the longer they stay in special ed, the more they look like they need it. The longer they stay in special ed, the more they look like they need it. What do you mean, Dr. Umar? I'll give you an example. Your daughter is in the sixth grade. 
she's reading on the fourth grade level. First of all, if she was my daughter, she wouldn't even be getting tested. Why not? She's two grade levels behind. Really? How about most of the kids in the Bronx are two grade levels behind? That's right. Who the hell chose my baby to go to special ed? Yeah. Are y'all following me? Yeah. Listen, I'm not saying being two grades behind is acceptable. It's not. We believe in black excellence. We believe in black excellence. We believe in black excellence. But what I'm saying is, if most kids in, the, in black school districts are two grades but belief level, shouldn't we be coming up with an intervention for the whole school? Why are we coming up with an intervention for one kid? And by the way, my Bronx parents, if I'm the first to tell you, special education is not a program. Special education is a business. And special education is a business of making money off of lazy black kids who we never taught in the first place. Oh, yes. Whenever Dr. Umar does an evaluation, guess what I got to do after I do the evaluation? If I qualify that child for special ed, which means as the certified school psychologist, I have determined based on the evidence, because I can't prove it. I can't prove it. I have determined based on evidence that this child is deaf, blind, speech and language impaired, traumatic brain injury, orthopedic impairment, learning disability, autism, emotional disturbance, other health impairment, de developmental delay. If I give them any one of those 13 labels, their name goes into a computer in New York City public schools, send their name to the state, and by the end of the month, the school gets a welfare check for your child. Special education ain't nothing but money. Special ed ain't nothing but a hustle. Special ed ain't nothing but a racket. You want to know how the black kids never get out? Because it's too much money to be made keeping them in. Oh, these are the facts. Yes. These are the absolute facts. That's right. That's why when we open up the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. Yeah. All you Negroes was hating on me. He's still in the school, buddy. I got your ass now. I ain't got one school. I got two schools. You fake, dusty, YouTube, broke ass. Ain't there nothing for nobody as hate. Oh, they was hating hard. Well, let me ask you a question. Who in here stood strong with me through the hate? Who, who stood strong with me through the hate? One love. Oh, yes. We got us a school, brothers and sisters. And the haters ain't stopped yet. Now they said, I made it up. <laughs> they said, I broke into a building, hired a film crew, put on a suit. I am the bus driver for the school, remember that. They did a 25 minute video before up. the owner got back. I'm heading gear. Now they looking for the D. They said I paid $10 for four buildings on a campus that cost, that cost $13 million when they built it. So if you can get a school for $2.50, I think we would have owned it already. <laughs> but we're not worrying about them. We got the nation built. Yes. And at that Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, I'm going to teach your sons and sciences. I'm gonna teach them political and military science. They got to understand white supremacy upside yeah. down and yeah. backwards yeah. and forwards. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay. Oh yes. And if you don't want me to teach them the truth, don't send them to my school. Because we're private. We're not government funded. So if you come in and act like a coon, I'ma kick your ass out. I shit. I shit. I shit. So while we at it. What's the three rules of white supremacy? Because y'all need to learn this too. Yeah. See, you didn't graduate from the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. You graduated from the We Hate Black Kids New York City Public Schools. <laughs> What's the first rule of racism? First rule of racism. First rule of racism. First rule of racism is all white people are racist. Look how quiet it is in here because you Negroes is cool. So, <laughs> look how, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All white folks is racist. Everyone. 
they dogs, they birds, they cats, they snakes, all of them. And here's why you have a conflict with that statement. You have a conflict with that statement because you believe racism equals racial hatred, and it doesn't. When I say all white people are racist, I didn't say all white people hate black people. In fact, the best racists love you. They sleep with your women. They sleep with your men. They play hip hop. They know how to twerk. They got businesses in your neighborhood. They dress like you. They talk like you. The best. You better stop it. The best racists know how to imitate black culture. Here's what I need y'all to understand when I say all white people are racist. Racism is not about hating black people. Racism is not about wanting to exterminate black people. You got white people who hate blacks. You got white people who want to exterminate blacks. Not every white person wants to exterminate you. Not every white person wants to hate you. So why do you say they're all racist then, Dr. Umar? Because racism is not about hate. Racism is about control. Every white person in New York loves the white privilege that they live on. And they have no problem with you suffering in order for them to enjoy it. Racism ain't got nothing to do with hating. It's all about power and control. Those white women who got Bill Cosby locked up, they sexed him up, took pills with him, got drunk, but at the end of the day, when they own white man called them up and said, would you do us a favor? They did it. You saw it with Ezekiel Elliott, the running back for the Cowboys, where he got in trouble last season. You heard what his white girl told him, what he said? She said, you're black. They're not going to believe you even if you make a million dollars. Oh yes, racism ain't about no damn money. I heard a Negro say the only color matter is green. But who makes the money green, you coon? (laughs) Racism is about power and privilege. Even when a black man got a white woman, this is why it's so dangerous to date white girls, because all she got to do is say you did something. You know how many black athletes I know who lost their full scholarships in college because the white girl got mad and accused them of rape? White girls know they got the upper hand even when you on top of them. Yes, Negroes. And you got black men talking about I don't date black women because they take too much money. Look what the white women are doing in, in the fourth court. Did y'all see RG3? This Negro broke and his white wife said she needs $16,000 a week to live. I hope she get a butt implant or something. Brothers and sisters, If we're going to save the black family, we got to save it ourselves. And black man and black woman, we got to stop all this hating I'm seeing on YouTube. The black woman is knocking at the black man, black man knocking at the black woman. We're supposed to be fighting together. And if you think the black man is who he is because he's lazy, you need to do your history. Two parent black families were the norm in this country from the day we got here, even in slavery, when it was illegal to get married, we still married. When do you see the rise of the single black female-headed household? 1970, not 1865. We was married through slavery. We was married through Jim Crow. We was married through civil rights. So how did we get here, Dr. Umar? Let me explain it. 1968, they killed Dr. King. Why did the FBI kill Dr. King and they hired the Italian mafia to do it? They killed Dr. King because Dr. King was about to get involved in economic empowerment of Africans. They said integrating lunch counters is fine, but this Negro was talking about the only thing that can ever save black folks with government intervention, and that's redistribution of America's wealth. Don't talk to me about being no American citizen. Don't talk to me about being equal. Don't talk to me about being free until you redistribute the wealth. Dr. King was gonna lead a breadbasket march. He was gonna bring poor black, poor white, poor Mexican, poor everybody. 
and they was going to go to Washington, D.C. in the fall of 68. And they was going to build a tent city. And no one under Dr. King's leadership was going to leave Washington, D.C. until everybody left with a job and a decent place to live. That would have embarrassed the United States government. They couldn't allow it. So King was murdered on the orders of J. Edgar Hoover with the assistance of the Ku Klux Klan, the Memphis Police Department, the Memphis Fire Department, and the Italian Mafia. The same Italian mafia they used to flood your community with dope in the 60s. And after they killed Dr. King, they said, we ain't gonna never let no black power revolution happen, ever again. I don't think y'all understand, but the 1960s almost broke the back of the United States government. They had to deal with the Nation of Islam, the Garvey movement, H. Rat Brand, Stokely Carmichael, SNCC, CORE, the Freedom Riders, the sit-ins, the Black Panther Party, they had all these different groups who honestly believed that black people had a right to be equal. So after they killed King, they said, we got to change this because we can never let this happen. We trying to fight a war in Vietnam so we can get a damn oil pipeline driven and we got radical Negroes burning cities down. How can we stop it? Somebody said, who's financing these black organizations? Because we're not. The government ain't financing the Nation of Islam. The government ain't financing the Black Panther Party. The government ain't financing SNCC and CORE. They said they own people giving them money. And the government said, how are they own people financing King and Malcolm? And they said, because most people in the black community are self-employed, skills men and skills women. They know how to work with their hands. They're bakers and barbers and electricians and plumbers and carpenters and metal workers and welders and auto mechanics. They own their own businesses. So the white man said, we got to kill that. And in 1970, 1970, they came into Harlem and came into the Bronx and came into Brooklyn, came into Queens, came into Staten Island, came into Newark, New Jersey, came into Patterson and Camden, and they went into the high schools and took out all the industrial building trade programs. Up until 1970, you didn't need a college degree to live a decent life. You graduated with a cosmetology license. You graduated with a plumber's license. You graduated with an electrician's license. You graduated with a welding license. But after 1970, it would never be the same again. After 1970, they would tell every last one of you to send your kids to college. And as a result of that, everybody in this room, me included, been going to college. Because somebody told you, if you want to be successful, go to college. So you go to college and you get your associate's degree. I got my associates. Go get your weed. My tree, get. my tree is low, people, so I'm leaving. Then you go looking for a job. Enjoy your night. See you soon. Beg up yourself. You don't have enough credits under your belt. Damn, let me go get a bachelor's. You go get your bachelor's. I know I can get the job now. No, you don't have enough liberal arts, and we don't see enough math courses. I'm sorry, you're about three credits short. Get a master's. You go get your master's. Go back. I'm sorry, we changed the requirements for the job. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna just go get my doctorate because I'm tired of these crackers. <laughs> you got your PhD. You know you good now. Magna cum laude PhD in grasshopper reproduction on the moon. <laughs> I know I'm gonna get the job now. Sorry, you still don't qualify. This is what they do with black people. They waste 30 years of your life sending you in educational circles for a job they never gonna hire you for anyway. And as a result of that, you got two million black people in America with masters and doctorate degrees unemployed right now. Raise your hand if you owe student loans. Look around this room, look at this. This is a damn crisis. You can put your hands down. I got six degrees, you can imagine. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, they have sold us a scam. 
We're going to be paying them loans back the rest of our lives. So Dr. Umar, are you saying I shouldn't send my daughter to college? No, I'm not. But I am saying you better answer three questions for me. Mm. Question number one. Did you raise your daughter or son with enough self-discipline to finish school without them living with you? Because most of you have raised shiftless, lazy children who don't do nothing unless they feel like it. And that is a problem because we all know that you got to learn how to do what you don't like to do to be in a place to do what you want to do. And most of us have children who cannot do that. What is the number one job of a black parent? The number one job of a black parent in the Bronx is to teach your child discipline. And what is Dr. Umar Johnson's definition of discipline? It's the ability to do what you don't want to do when it has to be done, whether you like it or not. Does your son have that? Does your daughter have that? Because if they don't, I want to know why you're spending $30,000 a year for Spelman and Howard and Clark and a university in Pennsylvania and some of you Negroes sent your child to California. That nigga will be smoking blunts all day. <laughs> so question number one, do they have the discipline to finish? Because I'm seeing too many black kids flunk out after two years, come home, no degree, $50,000 in debt. Question number two, are they majoring in something economically relevant that will allow them to pay back those student loans after they're done? Nope. Your son got a PhD in alien transformation. <laughs> for a damn alien worker. I met a Negro, he had a master's degree in liberal arts. I said, which one? He said, it ain't one, it's just liberal. I said, you're gonna be so liberated, you won't even have to get a job. Make sure what they major in is relevant because these colleges in New York City are very, very manipulative. That's right. Only 20 programs matter. The other 30 are only used to pay their bills. That's right. You ever be looking at the back of the public transportation bus and they say, we have a new master's degree in community organizing. <laughs> Excuse me. Where black people get organized? And then you look at the professor. Who's the professor? Dr. Ching Yang Wak. <laughs> Speaking of him, y'all better stop eating from these Chinese stores. Oh, <laughs> <better> stop. <laughs> I'm telling you, I believe that the Food and Drug Administration is in bed with the Chinese yeah. stop and goes. Yeah. And that they putting poison in the food they feed black folks. And the reason I believe this is because you have never seen license and inspection at a Chinese restaurant. They cook it with the same grease they made chicken wings for your grandmother with. And they haven't been put out of business yet. But let you open up a black restaurant. Ellen, I be there every day. Your stove's too small. You need another door. The bathroom seat ain't the right color. That's right. Chinese folks can do whatever they want. And you Negroes love those wings so much, you know they're not wings, but you're addicted to them. <laughs> that ain't no damn wing. When you ever seen a chicken gizzard look like that? No damn wing. You ever seen the Chinese wings? You take it out the bag, it look like a hand. <laughs> this ain't no damn wing. That's a damn hand. That's Faker, you eat Fakers. <laughs> you know Chinese chicken tastes like no other chicken. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. You buy a piece of Chinese chicken and taste like a Slim Jim. <laughs> and don't get me started on that rice and gravy, what's in that gravy? All the leftovers is in 
be great. And you raise your whole family on finger wings. And funky gray. And you know what's sad? I was in China. And they are racist as hell. Listen, in China, they don't have no civil rights bill. So guess what? This place is in China, black people can't live. Guess what? This store's in China, black people can't go into. Guess what? This nightclubs, we outside, and I don't party because I ain't got no rhythm. My white ancestors cursed me. But we was about to go to the club. And the brother said, Doc, we can't go over there. I said, why not? He said, black people can't go in there. I said, what? He said, that club don't allow black people. Mm. The Chinese are racist, and guess what they do, because they're not used to seeing black people in real life? Mm. If you ever go to China, I'm telling you now, you're going to be smacking a lot of Chinese people. <laughs> because they will pull out their phone, don't ask your permission, and take your damn picture. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the Great Wall of China, this little damn mountain cracker going to run up to me. I don't know you. So I said, you know what? I had enough of this shit. Why? I said no. <laughs> Black parents. At FDMG, we got to teach our kids stock market investing. I want them to understand interest in banking, penny stocks. Every child will have a bank account. Every child will have a penny stock account. Every child will have a business plan. Not ninth grade, but fifth. Because I'm sick and tired of us being wage slaves. And along with political science, we got to teach black children about the black bourgeoisie of New York City. See, remember now, first rule of racism is all white people are racist. Second rule of racism is white people don't share power with black folks. Did y'all hear me? White people don't share power with black people. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Ten years ago in Harlem, they said, we're going to build a Harlem for everyone. Now look at Harlem today. White folks don't live with black folks. They move you out. Because white people don't share power with black folks. If you don't believe me, name me a business that white folks have ever owned equally with black folks. Mm. They don't. They don't. Russell Simmons used to own Def Jam. Mm. Not no more. Famous Amos Cookies, he used to have them cookies. <coughs> Not no more. White folks, when you hear a Negro say, I'm going into business with a white man, you know you just met a coon. <laughs> What's the third rule of racism? The ends justify the means. We will poison your water. We will give your women dirty birth control pills that we know lead to all sort of fibroid tumors. We will pump AIDS and Ebola West now. We will give your sons this uh, measles, mumps, and rebellion shot that we know causes autism. White folks will do anything to get rid of you because What's the reason of racism in the first place? White genetic survival. They have to control you to make sure they can survive. Because one black man in a nation of white women can turn the color of the people tan in 50 years, brown in 75, and all black in 100. See, black men always ask me, Dr. Umar, why do they hate us so much? Brother, you don't understand why? You ain't got to have no money, no job. You could be homeless, two strikes. But guess what? You can have a white man, Chinese man, Arab, East Indian, and an African. They can have all the money, all the businesses, but guess what you got that none of them got? Genetic superiority. You, you make a baby with the Chinese woman, it's a black. You make a baby with the East Indian woman, it's black. You make a baby with the Anglo-Saxon woman, it's black. The black man is the only man on the planet who has 100% genetic superiority. <laughs> this is why when you walk into a room full of white girls and there's some white guys in there, they get a little insecure. 
Especially if you swag delicious. White men start shaking because white women have a natural attraction to the black man's melanin. It's natural. On a subconscious level, they know that melanin equals longevity for this species. So without even thinking about it, they want to reproduce with the black man to stay around. They don't know what drives them to the tall, dark, and handsome. They just know that they're driven to it. So y'all think the white man is uh, afraid and intimidated because of the black man's size. No, not every black man is blessed. Black women, no! Some of y'all had the Chinese wings. <laughs> it's not the size, it's the strength of the DNA. Same thing with a black woman. Any man put a seed in a black woman that's an African baby. Yes, come to No matter where you go in the world, you make yourself. You're the only people in the world who can do that. That's why they hate you, and they want to get rid of every last one of you to ensure that they survive. I know you don't want to hear me say this, but the African is the only human being who is 100% human. All of the other three, the ice cracker, the sand cracker, and the mountain cracker, they all have traces of Neanderthal DNA. All of them. They are cousins. All three of them. That's why the Arab is classified as white on the United States Census. They are family. We are family. All my Neanderthal cousins and me. We ain't got no friends, nobody like us. We are God's chosen people. Y'all got it screwed up, y'all. Is it the Hebrews? Is it to recreate the Neanderthal complex? If black men value black women as natural, they would be natural in 24 hours, every last one. But because we want a black woman's body but a white woman's complexion. They process themselves. So black man, I want you to do me a favor. This is Black History Month. This is our 400 years in America, 1619, 2019, for those whose ancestors came on ships and mines did. I know some of y'all did. I met a, a Native American down the street. Looked like an African to me, but he said he was Native. He must have had a blunt. I said, it's amazing you Negroes are so native because if you go to check out with the five major Native American tribes, every last one of them, because you know they got these reserves with the casinos on them, did you know that every last one of them wrote into their charters that no African American can claim any type of right to the wealth of their reserve? They wrote your ass out of you running around, silly ass. I met a Negro said his name was Chief I'm a hawk. He had on some Gucci's, a Louis bag, and some skinny jeans. I said, your ass, your name is Chief Tomahawk. Man. 